Once upon a time, a colleague and I wanted to teach C++. We wanted to make it easier to get started, so we used Kling, an interpreted version of Clang, Jupyter and Jupyter Hub, which provide interactive notebooks, and Docker, a container environment that le leverages the Linux kernel to package it all up. We created a tool called the C++ Explorer, and this is the GitHub link for that product. This talk, however, isn't about that. This talk has a prologue, and that prologue is, consists of presenting the tools that we use that aren't C++. The first are notebooks. Have you met Jupyter Notebooks? Notebooks are a great tool for experimenting and playing with code. Each cell is a distinct evaluation with distinct results that build on each other. The cells persist the output of each action. Cells can contain markdown instead of code. In fact, what you're looking at right here is a Jupyter notebook with a, inside a markdown cell. Markdown cells are, are powerful things that can even render LaTeX equations. Notebooks are great teaching tools. If any of you have had the experience of of writing a piece of code on a board and asking the students to execute it on their computers, you will remember spending the next 20 minutes going around correcting what the students typed on each screen because they made small changes, which they didn't notice. Um, the nice thing about the notebook is it shows everything, it has everything exactly the way it needs to be. So the student can just hit shift enter and the, and the cell will execute. If they want to actually make the conscious decision to change it, they can easily edit the cell and re-execute it. Um, notebooks are kind of like an executable paper. That is, they contain documentation, code, and the results of that code all in one package. Usually, Jupyter Notebooks are based on Python. They don't have to be. Kling comes with a notebook that is based on C++. However, through magics, that is, cells beginning with a percent percent, students can make individual cells execute in a different language. Here's an example of that right now. This cell registers a bash cell magic. The next, code, the next cell makes use of it. In this case, all we're doing is echoing hello world. The next part of our prologue is Docker. Have you met Docker? Docker is a lightweight container that makes use of the existing Linux kernel. It's simple to use. I offer you the example of the of the Docker image that's used in this presentation. It's based on Fedora 33. I use DNF to install the following packages. Um, I use, uh, I can copy files in from the current directory into the Docker environment. Um, I can run commands and so on. There are a few other capabilities. You can specify the user the commands are to run as, a working directory, and a command for the notebook to run when it starts up. The great thing about Docker, Docker images is they can encapsulate complex builds and provide a convenient sort of documentation for how to build a project. As an example, I inherited the EinsteinToolkit.org website. When I first got it, it was running RHEL 5, and we needed to update it. The problem was, that the system that was running the website uh, had been modified, tinkered with by people over the years, and nobody quite knew what things it did, how the functionality was installed, or what pieces of functionality were required on the server. We spent a month or so reverse engineering the website and how it worked and creating a Docker image to run it. Now it's clear what all the pieces are, how they're installed, what they do, and how to upgrade it to newer operating system versions. Sometimes that's as easy as a button click, just changing the, the from image that the, the, that the Docker image is built on. Sometimes it takes a little bit of code if the underlying packages have changed. This notebook environment is available on Docker Hub as, as the following name, Stephen R. Brandt, Clang Me. Uh, that's Clang Module Interactive. You can get it on your system if you have Docker installed by running the docker pull command here. Um, usually, however, one runs Docker images through a tool called Docker Compose. If you clone this repository that this presentation is based on, 
you can run Docker Compose up minus D, which will start the Docker image in the background. And then you can run Docker Compose logs, which will show the URL that you should open to view the presentation in your browser. So now our story begins. We're going to talk about Kling. Kling comes to us from the root project. It's an interactive C++ interpreter. And the C++ Explorer is based on Kling. It's great. Um, it provides incremental compilation and execution of C++ code. It works well most of the time. Kling, like any other complex tool, has a few problems. One of them is an LLVM bug. This uh, LLVM bug is listed here. The consequence of this bug is that you cannot run the standard async command inside a Kling environment. Perhaps this, this situation will be fixed at some point in the future, but what it did is it prevented us from teaching about C++ parallelism. Um, we, found a, we found a workaround though, however. Uh, the HPX library is, implements standard async and other parallel functions, and that doesn't rely on the thread local functionality, which is disabled by this bug. Another problem with Kling is that seg faults can kill a notebook. This is a bummer. It means that you lose all the definitions that you've uh, input so far, as well as all the data you've generated. You can uh, re regain that, regain the data in code by re-executing the cells, but you have to be careful not to do the seg fault again, whatever it is that led to that. Syntax errors can also sometimes kill a Kling kernel. Um, when, they don't, when the kernel doesn't die outright, sometimes the syntax errors are unrecoverable and the interpreter isn't able to parse anything after that. There are a few other funny problems that can occur, one of which is documented here. Kling is currently based on Clang version 5.0.0, which is somewhat behind the Clang 11 current build. Uh, Kling reports its own version as being 0.8 dev. So while Kling is a great tool, these particular problems cause a great deal of pain when teaching. So the question arises, is there an alternative? It occurred to me that modules might be such an alternative. And so uh, modules can provide us with incremental compilation, and they can be chained, each importing and exporting the previous one. So to make use of this, we're going to define two types of cells. We're going to have def code for defining code, and we're going to have run code for producing output and running code. This system works well most of the time and has limitations, which we will present to you in the course of this talk. Another kind of magic cell that Python notebooks support is write file. And this enables a sort of crude editor capability which is nicer than nano. Um, so in this case, I'm going to create the file aloha.cppm, which is a C++ module. This code begins by exporting itself. It then includes the IO stream package. And then it has an export block, which contains the void aloha world function. So let's create that file. All right, the next step is to compile it. Now we need to compile it twice. We need to create a PCM or compiled module file, and we need to create a .o file. Uh, and this cell documents both of those steps. It took me a while to find the right combination of flags from previous talks that would work to create the modules the way I wanted them to. In part, I think this is because the modules implementation has been evolving and the flags change, and the examples um, change. And, and so what you have here is a set of flags that will work with Clang 11 on Fedora 33 and a Docker image that makes sure you get those versions of those tools. Okay, I'm going to execute this cell. Okay, those two things are compiled. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna write out aloha.cpp and I'm gonna compile that. And then I'm gonna execute it, and I get Aloha World. So that all worked. What I did here in this line was I included the, the Aloha.cpp code, the Aloha.o Aloha code, and the Aloha module. 
All right, now, this is all a lot of typing for each individual module. And so what I've done is I've created a Python package called RunCode that allows me to, to do all these steps in uh, quick succession. Um, by default, it won't show you anything that it's doing. That's output level zero. If I want to see all the compilations and all the flags for the compilations, I can use verbosity level one. If I want to show the code I'm generating with each cell, I can have verbosity level two. And that's what I'm going to start with so that you can see how this is working. In our first module, all I'm going to do is define a symbol named hello. The standard string package is brought in by default. So this shows you the shell of code I'm writing around the, the contents of the cell, right? That goes right here. I'm putting everything inside an export block. I'm importing the Clang Me base module, and I'm creating temp, temp1, which is the first module in our notebook. I then compile that module to create, a, to create a PCM, and then I create a slightly different source file to create the .o file. Okay, and this compile time took 0.13 seconds, pretty fast. Now I'm gonna define the symbol world. This works pretty much the same way, except in this case, I'm importing module one, temp one. Now module temp one already imports the base module. So when I import module one, I'm getting the base, base module as well. Then I'm creating module two. And inside module two, I am defining world and here also, and I'm using very similar flags to, to compile everything. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is that when I create the .o files, I'm stuffing them inside a .a file. And so that way, with each step of this notebook, I can just link the .a file and it will bring all the past .o files into the compilation. Now we're ready to run our first line of code, which is just standard C out, hello, comma, world, period. Now, unlike the previous two uh, def code cells, run code doesn't persist anything that it creates. Okay, so it just imports temp2 and then it puts an int main and a return zero around the, the code inside. Then it just, just pastes the same code from the cell in the middle. Um, we have this single, this single compilation which brings in the .a file and uh, the previous PCM, PCM files and it all compiles and runs and we get hello world. So what we've got now is a system where we can chain modules together as we execute each individual cell and build up a more complex environment of symbols. Now that we've seen the basics of how this works, we can set the verbosity level to zero. Another feature that we've built into this notebook is the ability to change the compilation flags for individual cells that you want to run. Um, in this case, we have two flags that we're setting. We're, we're defining v equal to two, and we're going to use this code here to define m equal to one. So what this is going to do is it's going to read the global variable dem from the Python environment and replace it in this command line. And so when I run this code, I get hello, m equal one, v equal two. And in these uh, run code cells, I provide both compile time and run time so you can get a feel for the performance of your code. Now, the next thing I would like to do is show the results of performing significant computations. And a proxy for that is everybody's favorite uh, egregiously inefficient version of Fibonacci uh, probably the most inefficient way you can implement Fibonacci, and that's what you see here. The nice thing about this code is the, the amount of wor work increases dramatically as I increase n. And so once I get up to n equal 42, it takes already several seconds to run. So, uh, Let's think about that from the standpoint of, e of somebody using this notebook, right?
right? If, if I create this, this Fibonacci function and I want to use the values of, of the Fibonacci at 42 or maybe even something higher, I don't want to keep reusing, I want, don't want to keep recalculating that. I want that to be saved inside the notebook and I want to just be able to use it. Now, very naively, I might type something like this, um, int n, equal, n 42 equals fib 42 and save this result in a variable. Now, this works. The problem, however, is that what I'm doing is I'm not actually saving the result of this command. I'm just saving the instructions to run this command with this value. So when I run a cell that makes use of n equal 42, of n42, which is now a symbol in my environment, I take, in this case, three seconds because I have to recompute fib42, right? And this isn't what a notebook is about. We want to build up our computations. We want to, uh, we don't want to keep redoing them, okay? So the question is, how can we avoid redoing this calculation? Now, you should remember that because Fibonacci isn't really important, you just have to think of it as a proxy for something that is important and computationally intensive, that the student or perhaps a researcher who's, who's just trying to understand something uh, could, could be doing. So um, first I want to note that even though this N42 is defined in the environment and it has to be calculated in this way, it doesn't get calculated if we don't use it. So if I define a cell and tell it to run and I evaluate fib 10, this runs in essentially zero time because it doesn't need to reevaluate Fibonacci 42, even though N42 is in the environment. This may or may not be surprising to you. Regardless, it's nice. If I stick uh, a symbol in there that in my environment that requires a complex evaluation, I don't have to keep paying for it. Okay, so let's think about a real way to fix this problem. Um, one of the ways that we could potentially fix this problem is with const expression. Const expression is sort of built for this purpose, right? It's the purpose of const expression is to do the evaluation at compile time and then save the result, which is exactly what we want. So we're going to define the const expression fibc, and it's, it looks almost the same as the code we had before, except it's got a different name and it's got const expression in front of it. Um, now, to significantly, to make use of, of this thing, we need some, some flags set differently in the compilation phase. Uh, we have to tell the const expression system that it's allowed to use many more steps than it normally would, and it's allowed to use 40 levels of recursion. So let's uh, enter that cell, uh, that, that those flag definitions, and now we're going to compile a cell that evaluates fib42, or fib28. Unfortunately, fib42 wasn't possible. Um, it's just, it requires more steps than the compiler is willing to give me. However, for illustrative purposes, we can do fib28. Now, I ran into a problem here, and that is this basic line of code here, where we assign the constant expression to a constant expression variable, uh, would not work inside the module system in its current state. So for this purpose, I created an extern variable to hold the result. And I created this hack, uh, if, if, you, as you, if you will, this percent percent lib that defines code that goes in my .o file, but not in my .pcm. So when I execute this cell, okay, which happens in 1.35 seconds, I am evaluating Fibonacci 128 and storing it. Okay, and now when I run the code, it happens very quickly, essentially in zero time, because that value has been pre-computed and stored. Maybe someday it will be a little easier to use this uh, const expression facility. We won't have to uh, worry about how many steps we allow the compiler to take and expression depths and so on. But regardless of what happens, we face a problem, okay? And that is that any result that we are computing with const expression is being stored in the object file and retrieved. Now that's fine if our result is a, is a number, like an integer or a floating point number. It's not fine if it's, say, an array of a million floating point uh, values. So for that kind of circumstance, no matter how well const expression works, 
it's not going to be good enough. We're gonna, we're, it's going to force us to constantly put things to and from the disk and maybe even eat up a lot of disk space, which we don't necessarily want to do. Uh, fortunately, there's another way to store values between cell evaluations, <clears throat> and that's with shared memory. Now, there is a facility for doing this uh, called from Boost. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't compile in header files. So I'm going to uh, encapsulate it. I've, I have encapsulated it in sort of our basic library. And there's nothing great or artistic about the way I've done that. It's just sort of a proof. Hi, I'm just uh, going to interject. I got a question here. Is the const expression plus module problem a C++ limitation? or a limitation of the code you develop. Um, I would say it's it's neither. I, I would say it's a it's a limitation of the current state of development of the module system. I mean it's not it's not completely ready yet. It's still somewhat experimental. And so that's that's the uh, that's the issue that we're having here. All right. Um, I now restart the uh, the talk. Proof of concept. Now, to illustrate that proof of concept, I'm going to create a small class called counter. It has a single field, integer n. It gets initialized to zero. When the counter is destructed, it prints this reset message. Um, and when the count method is called, the current value of n is printed out, and that value of n is incremented. Okay, so let's, let's evaluate that line of code. All right. Now, this is the this is this is my shared memory uh, interface. So we create an object of type seg. It has a name of the memory segment, which creatively is called mem. We're going to allocate a piece of that uh, shared memory segment uh, of type, and we're going to allocate that piece of type counter, and it's going to be named counter. So in order to access that memory, what we're going to need to know is the name of the segment and the name of the object within that segment. And the allocate method is going to return to us a pointer. And if we rerun that cell, we're going to get a pointer to that same sh shared memory segment. Okay. Then what we're going to do is we're going to call the count method, which will print out the current value of n. If n reaches the value of 5, we're going to remove that segment and the destructor will be called. So let's do that. So when we run it the first time, we get n equal 1. Two, three, four, and when I run it the, this time, right, it prints n equal four, but because this is an n plus plus, the value of n is five, and that triggers the remove, which means that we get our reset counter message. And so when I run it the next time, I'm back to zero. Okay, so that shows the basic uh, shared memory facility. And um, in this case, uh, counter is just another proxy for a calculation, right? I could have stored FIB42 in a shared memory segment, and then I wouldn't need to uh, go through the various pieces of complexity and, and so forth that I went above with constant, went through above with constant expression. Um, what's nice also is this shared memory uh, trick or technique could be used with Kling in the Kling notebooks to maintain continuity of calculations. So uh, in Kling, we could we could set up this same thing, possibly including the boost header without some special wrapper. And then we could do array-based calculations. And if we get seg faults, we wouldn't necessarily be harmed because the shared memory segment would still be out there and we could still just read it back in. I um, built some because I'm, I'm thinking that ultimately when you're using notebooks with C++ calculations, you might be doing something with arrays, um, I built a prototype array implementation. And this particular array implementation um, you, works as before, except you give it a size as well as a type. And if, you, if, this, if this particular execution of the memory um, allocation is also the initial one, this init variable gets set, which allows you to do some custom initialization in the cell if you want to. Now, this particular cell removes the segment as soon as it creates it. So it just here we just show that, yes, we can do this without getting a, a seg fault or other error. Um, and we show the basic syntax. Um, okay, 
So let's take a look at uh, a little more interesting example. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to create two arrays. Uh, one is A and one is B. They're both of the same size. And essentially what we're going to do is store in A, we're going to store a coordinate value. And in B, we're going to store the sign of that value. And the coordinate's going to go from 0 to 15. So the idea is if one were to graph this, one would have a nice pretty sine wave, which is the, the essence of what we're going after here, graphing. Um, because if you are dealing with, uh, if you are dealing with arrays, you're going to want to, to graph them at some point. You're going to want to see uh, either the, the, the 1D array that you're working on or slices of the 2D or 3D array or maybe, you know, surface plots from, from data. And matplotlib uh, is a facility in Python for, for doing those things. And it's simple and it's already available in notebooks. And not only is it available, but notebooks are designed to, uh, to, to understand the output of those libraries. So we can just plot things in a notebook cell and see it in the notebook. Now, what would be nice is if we could take our C++ code and make use of that facility. It would be unfortunate if we had to uh, copy the data uh, into, into Python memory or to a file and then to Python or, or something like that, because this was the thing that we were trying to avoid with our move to shared memory in the first place. Um, fortunately, there is a way to do this. Uh, PyBind 11. So let me show you PyBind 11 page. Um, and so PyBind 11 is a, is, a, is a framework for integrating Python and C++, and it's a particularly nice one, I think. Um, and in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to take our ClangMe uh, base library and our ability to allocate arrays with segment name and object name, and we're going to read them in as a Python object and then reinterpret them as a NumPy array. And then once we've reinterpreted these things as NumPy arrays, we can plot them. And I suppose it makes sense to actually evaluate this cell before you try to plot it. And then you see your nice sine wave. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, PyBind 11 code. Now, I'm not showing you this because this code is essentially beautiful, but it is quite simple. So to uh, implement a PyBind 11 class, right, you just need to create something of this nature. Um, this is going to allow you to, to uh, read in a, a buffer protocol, right? And this is going to be the mechanics of, of what makes that buffer protocol possible. So with this 10 lines of code or so, I've taken my, my basic array class that I've created and I've made it possible for Python to access that memory directly. Okay. So that takes us through uh, the basic discussion of shared memory and arrays and, and uh, Keeping, keeping results around persistently as we're working through our notebook, despite the fact that module compilation is essentially just code compilation. All right, so the next topic that we wanted to teach, uh, that we wanted to teach our students was parallel programming. And as I told you, um, in Kling, that, that didn't work because of a bug in the underlying LLVM. But in this notebook environment, it works out pretty simply. So first, we're going to import future. And you notice that this is, the, uh, this is the syntax that's used for modules to import existing packages. Um, and so we're going to import future. Then we're going to use the async to uh, launch this as a background command in a thread. And then... Um, we're going to allow that to just start off its execution, and then we're going to use the get method to block, wait for the result to finish, and return it. Um, and that looks like this, okay, A equals 42. So 
Um, obviously, that was such a trivial amount of work, it finished almost instantly, but this shows the basic facility is operational. Uh, now, I mentioned that we, uh, we used HPX in Kling because it was, it was difficult, uh, it was impossible to use the standard async package in Kling, but HPX still has value even in this kind of environment um, beyond what's offered in standard async. Here is the HPX website. Um, HPX is, uh, it's, it's a tool for doing parallel computations and it not only provides a, you know, the existing, uh, 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 an implementation of the existing capabilities of parallelism in C++, it maintains a cutting edge uh, interface to the proposed and newly implemented standards by the C++ group. Um, maybe some experiments of things that they might want to consider doing. So in this example, we're going to bring in HPX. And to do it, um, HPX requires certain flags to be set in the environment. And we're going to bring that in using the package config command. That's going to bring in our, our, our various flags for compilation. And this code here in this cell isn't terribly interesting, except that, as I say, it's just designed to, to open the package config command, read its output, and then set these uh, flags that my run code package uses, the app flags and the mod flags. It's going to strip out the std equals seven, C++ 17 flags that are set by HPX because we need to have a C++ 2A for our modules work. Um, but that is, that's okay. So now here is what the same code cell looks like with HPX that we just ran, uh, this calculation of 42 that's done asynchronously. Um, now HPX needs to replace main, fortunately in order to, in order to function the way it functions. And uh, in this case, we're gonna replace main by just bringing in this header. It's going to pound define the main symbol to be HPX main and then do the appropriate thing. So we'll be able to run um, without difficulty. Now, there is one problem that we have when doing this. And that is it took about six and a half, almost seven seconds to compile this code. Uh, HPX has a lot of headers. It's doing a lot of interesting things. And this would, this would be so much nicer if modules were capable of, um, of compiling the HPX headers. At the moment, they're not. Um, I'll, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about why in a minute, but essentially the problem isn't fixable at the moment. So if you wanna use HPX, you're stuck with this slightly longer compile time. However, uh, there is a trade-off. There is something that you get um, in exchange for that. So let's explore that just briefly. Um, I'm gonna define a vector, which is can be done this way. And I'm gonna define run flags. Now, by default, um, what HPX is gonna do when it's running is it's going to run everything in one thread. Um, it's able to, uh, it's able to save the state of calculations and put save the stacks of the current calculation and swap in a new one. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's able to do, uh, so it's able to emulate parallelism essentially in one thread. But for the sake of this example, we're gonna move it up to three thread, to four threads. And that's, that can be done by setting this, this uh, run flags variable. So HPX makes makes it possible to use what are called parallel algorithms, all right? In this case, we can, we can run a for loop and it will automatically get parallelized using HPX's threads underneath. Um, and if I run this, what I will see is the output gets mixed up, of course, because I'm, I'm printing out from threads and the threads are overlapping each other. So we see the n equal, n equal, n equal, and then threads one, zero, three, and two print out, and then four and five print at the end. Again, we paid a long compilation time, but we got this nice uh, parallelism for a loop uh, in C++. Um, another facility that we can, 
we can make use of in um, C++ is then. So I showed you in the, the previous uh, asynchronous code example, we created a background process, background task to execute this 42 calculation. And then um, we used a.get to block and receive the result. Well, you may not want to block and receive the result. You may want to say, hey, this is a calcul I, I have a calculation that I want to, to take place after this one, but I don't want to block and wait for this one to finish. And the way you can do that is with then. So in this case, I'm calling then, I, I, I calculate result one, which is 41. And then I'm going to calculate result two, which is going to be the result of one plus one. Um, and the, the logic here is that uh, this continuation that's, that's triggered by then um, takes a, a function that takes a future as an argument. So what's going to happen is when, when the then is called, this future is going to be ready. That is, this value is going to be ready for, for get to be called, so it will not block. Uh, it still needs to come in here as a future and not as an integer because it's possible that in the course of this previous calculation, an exception was thrown, and we need an, oper uh, an opportunity to catch that somewhere. So when I call get, if an exception was, was thrown in the calculation of this first result, um, I will see it now. It will, it will happen at this point. But obviously, this, this code is not going to fail, and we're just going to get 1 plus 41, which is going to be 42. So let's execute that. And so once again, we get 42, which is our favorite number and our favorite result. Um, I would like to point out that there are many other parallel algorithms that you can make use of in uh, HPX. Um, you can do reverses and transforms of all kinds of uh, different, in, in all kinds of different ways. Um, and again, I think this will be much nicer once uh, the module system is more mature and I'm able to take the HPX headers and put them in modules and won't have to recompile them each time and pay these, these kinds of penalties. Um, I told you that the HPX headers don't compile. And uh, one of the reasons they don't compile is that the CXXABI.h header doesn't compile. And that's one of the ones it, it brings in. And it's possible to uh, fiddle with what HPX does so that it doesn't bring in this header or that this header doesn't cause a problem. But if you do that, uh, then yeah. you just run into another problem. And, and so um, I think the, pro the appropriate solution to this is just to wait for the header system to be, for the module system to become more mature. So in the conclusion, I think we've got the beginnings of something that is possibly interesting and, and usable. In some cases, it will provide the functionality of Kling without some of the drawbacks. Of course, everything is a trade-off. Um, but at this point, I, I think that there's enough, there are enough things that don't work that I wouldn't want to switch over to it in a teaching environment just yet. Um, I, I think that uh, the promise is there, and I, I think that it's also possible that this technique of chaining modules together and building up a, uh, a sort of a library of symbols on the fly might be usable in other contexts. But in any event, um, I think that, I, I hope that you have found this interesting, and I hope that... Uh, you know, you have enjoyed this, this delving into this rabbit hole of what is possible with modules and interactive computing. Thank you. All right, that's the end of my presentation. I'll take questions now. Um, I have, uh, what is the mechanism for including new C++ library, custom or third party into this notebook? So uh, currently this notebook is both a GitHub repository and a, and a Docker repository. If you want to include other things, you could just download it and all the code is right there. You can just change it. Um, if you, know, you want uh, help with doing that, I'd be happy to provide it. Um, 
So yeah, uh, you can just download it from Git and look at it and add your own things to the Docker file and re rebuild the Docker image on your own machine. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, are there others? Anyway, thank you for, for your attention and I hope you enjoyed this talk.